Imagine what gaming would be like if you actually got hurt when you took damage in a game. Would you still want to play a fighting game if it left you battered and bruised in real life? What if you got electrocuted every time you took damage in a shooter? From literally shocking remotes to sonar attachments to help you find fish underwater, we're going to take a look at some of the most ridiculous tech in gaming history. Will we also talk about a video game console from a certain rapper known as Soldier Boy? Maybe, but there's only one way to find out. Toshiba Bubble Helmet The Toshiba Bubble Helmet is as silly as it sounds. We can only imagine Toshiba execs sitting around a table in their well-tailored suits going, you know what people want, to wear their TV as a helmet. The idea was just that, a product that would allow you to have a complete 360-degree view of your gamer video content, which is actually an awesome idea as we know today. If he had told us this product had debuted in the 90s, we'd understand. But this bad boy was unveiled in 2006 and was far too bulky and ridiculous. It even had head tracking, which is amazing, but the execution is just terrible. It's hard enough for parents to get on board with VR and video games in general, but we can only imagine the horror on our parents' faces if they walked in on us with this thing on our head. We can already hear him yelling, you'll go blind with a screen that close to your eyes. Ugh. Anyway, it's no surprise then that this weird gadget never made its way to the consumer market. Mindwire V5 Next up, we have the Mindwire V5, a product that aimed to replace a controller's vibration with electrical shocks to provide a more immersive experience. The idea was to make getting hit in a fighting game or first-person shooter carry more weight, and hopefully help you avoid getting hit. Ideally, this would work great for increasing your KDR in Call of Duty, but in reality, it would just add more stress to the gaming experience. The product was shown off in 2008, and the company compared the sensation to those electronic muscle toning things you see in old infomercials. They claimed it was perfectly safe, but at the same time boasted a pretty long list of health warnings on their site, including not to use it for more than 45 minutes at a time. Sold? You could get yours for the small price of $195. Get shocked every time you get hit and dead or alive. What a steal! Just kidding, the product never took off and the website hasn't been updated in over a decade. Honestly, we don't see why you'd need to be shocked to improve your KDR. The trash talking from the 12-year-old kids is already motivation enough for us to not die in COD. Fantasy Star Online GameCube Controller Back in the year 2000, when online gaming was still in its infancy stage, one of the first online game consoles came out for the Nintendo GameCube. That game was called Fantasy Star Online. To promote chatting amongst your friends and new squad mates, Nintendo released a full-sized keyboard controller. Not a keyboard adapter for the GameCube, oh no. We're talking about a literal full-sized keyboard with Japanese lettering sandwiched in between two ends of a GameCube controller. The controller looks absolutely ridiculous, but it comes in eggshell white and GameCube blue, so there's that. The fact that we already had cell phones with tiny QWERTY keyboards really made the whole thing look even more insane. That didn't stop Nintendo, though. The product was released exclusively for Japan, the only place where products like this can exist. Like the Toshiba Teletubby head, uh, we mean the bubble helmet, the idea was solid, but the execution was horrendous. We later saw the influence of keyboard attachments for the Xbox and PlayStation, so people could still write walls of text explaining all the horrible things they've done to your mom after brutally beating you in Halo. Sega Activator Continuing the trend of horrible execution, we have the Sega Activator. Where do we even start with this thing? Okay, the idea was that you could use your body instead of a controller. Hang on, we're not done. Rather than mapping out your movements like the Xbox Kinect or any modern VR system, the Sega Activator placed eight IR sensors on the floor around you in an octagonal pattern and would have you punch or kick to emulate a button press. It's really just using a controller with more steps, but wait, it gets worse. The system required its own power supply to help clutter your living room, and here's our favorite non-feature for the activator, no support for two simultaneous actions. In other words, you couldn't press two buttons at once. Imagine playing Street Fighter but not being able to Hadouken. Madness. The product had native support for just three games, and for the rest, you'd have to map the buttons to different IR zones. Looking at this thing in action just makes us feel so uncomfortable. Before it was justly and swiftly discontinued, you could have bought your very own Sega Activator for 80 bucks. Soldier Boy Console You guys remember Soldier Boy, right? Eh, neither do we. But back in 2018, you might have heard of his gaming console. Probably not, but maybe. 
In 2018, Soldier Boy released a console and a handheld device. We're gonna focus on the console only, which he sold on his e-commerce store. He also sells fake AirPods, jewelry, and clothing. It's basically a bunch of knockoff drop shipped items. When it came to his gaming console, things were no different. The Soldier Boy X Pro 801 console boasted Ultra HD 4K content. 800 games, the ability to sideload games via an SD slot, and two controllers for only 150 bucks. In reality though, you got a Raspberry Pi and a cheap Xbox looking console with knockoff PS4 controllers and a power supply that was more dangerous than useful. When talking about the console, the only word that comes to mind is janky. The OS is plain and has no features. You scroll through a list of game titles and then play a washed out cut off version of that game. Hard Pass. Dragon Quest Metal Slime Controller Square Enix is famous for many gaming titles, such as Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest. In 2014, Square Enix released this unique slime controller for the PS2, based on the monster and mascot of the Dragon Quest franchise. The controller is big, round, and blue, with the iconic slime smiley face on the opposite side of the buttons. The controller is so big that it distorts the positioning of the buttons and thumbsticks, and just looks very uncomfortable. However, some people really liked it, and used it more as a display piece than an actual controller. Fast forward to 2017, and Square Enix released a new one for the PlayStation 4. The controller looks more or less identical, but now features a touchpad. As weird and uncomfortable as this controller looks, it appears to be pretty popular, because Square Enix has now partnered with Nintendo to bring the Slime controller to the Switch. The Slime is now available as a Switch Pro controller, just as unwieldy as ever. Instead, this time, it comes with a cool stand for the Switch, featuring Slime propped proudly above a treasure chest. Weird controller for sure, but a pretty cool piece of memorabilia. Famicom Pachinko Controller Japan is chock full of quirks and oddities. For example, in Japan, it's technically illegal to gamble outside of sports betting. However, like most humans, Japanese people love casinos and gambling. To work around this frustrating legality, Japan has something called pachinko parlors, which are like arcades but made specifically for gambling. They're essentially slot machines masquerading as arcade cabinets, usually in the form of some sort of pinball type game. You don't win actual money, but there's usually a shop nearby that will buy your pachinko winnings. So, now that you know a brief history of pachinko, Nintendo released a pachinko controller for the Famicom, which was a weird-looking Famicom controller that would emulate the feeling of the pachinko experience. Of course, it couldn't emulate the actual gambling experience or the winning of any type of prize. And then there's the whole morality of it being marketed to children. The pachinko controller was only briefly sold in Japan before being cancelled. Famicom Top Rider Racing games have always been the genre with the most peripherals. We remember playing Need for Speed Hot Pursuit with full pedals and a steering wheel growing up. Little did we know that the racing wheel was actually preceded by the racing bike. That's right, in the early 90s, Nintendo released an entire inflatable motorbike for the game Top Rider. It was playable on the Famicom and was obviously meant for children. Some crafty adults learned that you could still use it if you're constantly holding a squat, but if you're the type of adult who owns a Famicom Top Rider inflatable motorbike, you probably can't hold a squat long enough for the duration of the race. I'm not hating, I can't either, so. Speaking of which, the game was extremely basic. You could choose between Touring and Grand Prix mode, and you had to use the inflatable controller to play the game, unless you entered a cheat code at the start menu. The bike itself is more like a giant inflatable rectangle with a printed image of a motorcycle, and allowed you to connect a little handle including a throttle, brake lever, and high gear switch for when things got real crazy. You could even do a wheelie to get your racer to do a wheelie in the game. Honestly, it's worth the $60 just to do a wheelie. Nintendo Game Boy Pocket Sonar Fishing is a very popular… sport? Is fishing a sport or just an activity? Either way, it's popular, especially in Japan, which is why so many popular titles have fishing aspects. Remember Ocarina of Time? Yeah, yeah, you could fish in that game. You could fish that guy's hat right off of his head. Bandai really took the idea to the next level when they released the Game Boy Pocket Sonar in Japan. It's a Game Boy game that comes with a sonar attachment. You'd throw the sonar into the water, it would float along the surface and report information back to the Game Boy via a long cable. The cartridge itself required four AAA batteries and included a waterproof bag so your Game Boy didn't get damaged while you were fishing. The display would show you some information such as what the sonar detected, as well as the depth of the water. The craziest part is that the pocket sonar worked perfectly as advertised. And that's not all. It also included a small fishing minigame and a complete fish encyclopedia that allowed you to search for all kinds of fish based on water condition, name, or the 8-bit silhouette they provided. Talk about a useful accessory. 
Nintendo 64 Biosensor Tetris has been around for so long that it feels like every Tetris-related avenue has been explored. We even played Tetris on my calculator in math class growing up. In 1998, while exploring the endless possibility of Tetris-related accessories, SETA, a Japanese company, developed the Biosensor. The Biosensor is an attachment for the N64 controller that clips onto your earlobe of all places and sends your heart rate data back to the controller. It would allow Tetris 64 to offer some unique game modes that would change the shape of the Tetris blocks based on your heart rate. We questioned the accuracy of a heart rate monitor that clips onto your earlobe, but apparently it worked very well and gave similar readouts to the more advanced sensor on the Apple Watch. It's cool to see early adaptations of things that we currently have. There are many heart rate sensors nowadays that track your heart rate while in-game, as well as other sensors that track eye movement, for example. If there's one constant from these wacky accessories, it's that while silly and poorly designed, the ideas behind them are very good and are still seen today in a more polished way. Let us know in the comments what kind of accessories you'd like to see in the future, and don't forget to subscribe to The Gamer for more gaming videos. Thanks for watching.